Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, um, and congratulations on this wonderful initiative spanning uh, three countries. It's really very, very impressive to see. Um, I thought I'd start off maybe by giving you two or three minutes on my involvement in this field over the years. Um, when I was first appointed as a young regional medical officer for one of the health regions in England in 1986, I started to have a procession of doctors coming to see me, expressing concern about their colleagues, uh, about their safety and about their uh, standard of care, although those words were not particularly used in the discussions. And each time they came, I'd say, well, could you let me have something in writing? Would you be prepared to make a statement? And always the answer was, well, no. We wanted just to let you know about this confidentially. Um, and so I, I set out on a task, really, of trying to deal with some of these long-standing problems and um, eventually wrote uh, a paper, a series of 100 cases, in the British Medical Journal in 1994. So my first introduction to this field, as many people's um, are, uh, introduction is, was dealing with poor performance. And then subsequently I became Chief Medical Officer, introduced the concept of clinical governance, uh, put together a program on patient safety, and set up a national system outside the regulation uh, of doctors within the NHS for addressing poor performance because it wasn't well dealt with in those days. Um, I always think it's slightly sad that most discussions um, of medical practice uh, tend to focus on the uh, the bad end of the spectrum, which amounts to something like 5% of most medical workforces that have been studied around the world. Um, but I often think about the other 95%, and really, I hope that today's discussion will mainly be about that, um, uh, taking, if you like, the perspective that we want to improve everybody's practice and not just simply deal with the relatively small number of people who uh, cause a direct hazard to patients, although it's very important to have systems in place for that. So over the years, um, I've been privileged to hold strategic roles, both at a large health region, but also at the national level as chief medical officer, to help to introduce new policies. But amongst the most inspiring things that I've seen are the examples of, of excellence in clinical care, in leadership, in the motivation of teams, and in the dedication to patients. So if ever, somebody like me who often was dealing with a lot of nasty problems were to lose faith, then I only had to touch base with some of the places that I knew uh, were fountains of excellence in care to restore my faith that basically the medical profession is still strong and is still patient orientated. But we need to go further, we need to readjust, and we need to realign something. So that's the purpose of my presentation today, to unpack some of those issues which hopefully will be of value as you go through the rest of the day, which is what a keynote presentation is supposed to do. A lot of, uh, of the writings of, um, about professions m try to make a distinction between occupations and professions. And this example is quite often uh, put out. Uh, a juggler is a form of occupation. It's a highly skilled, not everybody can do it, but is it a profession? Um, just because it's highly skilled and not many people can do it, is, a profession, is it a profession? And the answer to that, um, the broad consensus, is no. Um, a profession has something more to it than that. So what is that something more that characterizes a profession? Um, I hate people who start off with dictionary definitions, and I swore that in my career I'd never decided. This is actually a first. I went back to the Oxford English Dictionary, but I'm not loading you down with the formal uh, definition. Uh, I'm picking out some of the key strands. So when you look at the formal definition of a profession, then it contains phrases like this, mastery of a complex body of knowledge and skills, vocation and service of others, autonomy and the privilege of self-regulation, accountable to those served and to society. But as we all know, a dictionary definition is very different 
to a word in use and its everyday meaning. And if you play around with the concept of uh, professionalism, then it can mean different things. I mean, you, even, even the, the body language and the facial expressions in this tell you that there's something else going on here. And perhaps this is the use of the term professionalism when you use it about somebody doing their best under difficult circumstances. They're very professional. I admire their professionalism. And it's not so much that they are aligning themselves with professional values as such, it's that they're trying to do so in difficult circumstances. So there is a need for some concentration on definitions and semantics, uh, not to be pedantic about it, but just to recognize that out there, the people who are practicing medicine may not have been involved in debates at this level. And they need to know what's expected of them when they get up in the morning without reference to um, the output of meetings like this. They need a simple uh, way to guide their practice day to day. And I think that's the importance of the work you're doing, to keep it simple and to have a model of professionalism that everybody can understand and doesn't need to um, read an extensive report to understand how to do it. But essentially, the relationship that we're looking to explore is the relationship between what the profession stands for and then how the individual practitioner day to day embodies the things that the profession stands for. And in the limited time I've got available, I haven't got the opportunity to cover too much scholarly work. So I just want to pick two strands uh, and highlight them from amongst what is a very large body of literature, both recent and historical, on the subject of professionalism. The first is the work which I'm sure you're familiar with, done by the Royal College of Physicians in London. Their report, Doctors in Society, followed a period of evidence giving and assessment. I gave evidence to it. And they came up with this uh, definition of um, professionalism. Signifies a set of values, behaviors, relationships that underpins the trust the public has in doctors. And as a broad brush statement of what a profession is all about, that's pretty good. It doesn't work so well as an operational uh, it doesn't quite pass the get out of bed every morning test for the individual practitioner. And they looked at some of the things that are in, for example, the, uh, the, de the definition I gave you, and rather regarded these as archaic and, and old fashioned and actually dismissed things like mastery of knowledge, autonomy, privilege, and self-regulation. That's quite a lot of things to kick out of the concept of professionalism, but we'll come back to that in a minute. And they did, as you probably know, uh, introduce these and just look at the highlighted words, words like integrity, compassion, altruism, continuous improvement, excellence, partnership, working uh, with patients. So there you are. I'm, I'm not going to spend any more uh, time on, on that particular strand of work. It's important. It's widely quoted. It was a very thorough review of professionalism. But is it, is it valuable, as I say, in the day to day? And then probably the second piece of scholarly work that I wanted to highlight is, uh, emanates from uh, a sociologist, uh, probably the most celebrated thinker and writer on the subject of professions, a man called Elliot Friedson, who is an American and uh, who wrote a series of uh, books and monographs and papers on this subject, which I think are quite excep exceptional. One called The Medical Profession, another called uh, Professional Dominance. A very, I've gone back to this many times over the year, years. And essentially, he picked out um, many of the same features that have been covered in the later work that I've alluded to, but th this concept of, of society granting autonomy to an occupational group, that's at the essence of what the medical profession is, being trusted and granted 
and autonomy to do their work with, certainly in the 1970s anyway, a, a very minimum amount of interference. Things have changed a bit since then. We'll come back to that. Um, involvement in a prolonged uh, body, a prolonged period of specialist training in a body of knowledge. And then this other absolutely crucial aspect of, of the profession, the profession is almost defined by its um, complete authority over controlling entry and exit, so saying who will be a doctor and who won't be a doctor anymore, and the training that, that creates a doctor. To be a profession and a powerful profession, you have um, all of that is yours under, under your total control. And Friedson picked this out. Another very interesting thing he, he said, which is a bit debatable, but it is, is a very interesting idea and isn't talked about so much, is essentially doctors define what illness is, which is quite something, really, if you look at it that way and, and adds to the power and status of the uh, profession. And then this concept of service orientation. And when he was writing in the 1970s, um, Friedson saw some of these things as quite negative as far as the patient and society was concerned, and indeed saw risks for the profession in them. So, for example, having mastery of, of knowledge and skills, the downside of that is that nobody else is allowed in, even though they might have some good ideas. So there's an element of protectionism. And there is an element, a risk of paternalism creeping in. I know best because I am the master of these knowledge and skills. So less room for the patient's perspective in that traditional view of what a profession is. And the control of entry and exit and the training, the downside of that is if you don't think about it, you could end up perpetuating a culture that you don't want to see perpetuated. So that's the downside of that. Nobody else really gets involved in that, so you don't get the wind of change coming in necessarily from outside, and there, that, that is another risk. And then finally, the um, defining, diagnosing, and expanding the domain of disease risks medicalization of things that don't really need to be turned into illnesses. And the uh, radical opponent of all of this, as you, some of you may remember, uh, was a man called Ivan Illich, who wrote very iconoclastic things in the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s. So in the end, in the 1970s, uh, Friedson concluded this, I now believe that the expertise is in danger of being used as a mask for power and privilege rather than advancing the public interest. And I think this is where Ian Kennedy in his Wreath Lectures uh, many years ago, which were entitled Unmasking Medicine, was driving at, at, at this. Ironically, Friedson, who died uh, in, in the mid-2000s, latterly in his writings changed his position quite radically, having seen the power and dominance of the medical profession rather negatively, came to believe that in an era of commercialization and marketization of healthcare, that um, having a profession uh, preserving traditional values was actually essential for the welfare of the public and patients. But that, that view came to him quite late in life. So I gave evidence to the, uh, the doctors in society the Royal Constitution's Working Party. And I'm just going to pick out some of the things I gave written evidence and verbal evidence. And um, I gave rather unconventional written evidence, and I think the committee were not quite sure what to make of this. But essentially, I have felt, well, everybody's going to be writing in long essays about this. And I stuck to quotations. So they had four questions they were asking all witnesses. And I just gave them a quotation in return because I felt that the ability to reflect quite deeply on this subject was better achieved by um, giving something which wasn't quite so straightforward to think about. Three of my quotations 
not surprisingly, come from William Osler. So they asked all witnesses, do you think that professionalism has any meaning today? And what I drew from Osler's writings was this. You are in this profession as a calling, not a business, as a calling which exacts from you at every turn self-sacrifice, devotion, and tenderness to your fellow human beings. So I think what I was saying there is that to me that is the true meaning of professionalism, that deep compassion, that deep solidarity with the person who's ill and who's in front of you. And so I think it's an open question, is that alive, well, certainly at the time I gave it, was it alive and kicking? And my feeling was it wasn't completely alive and kicking in the sense that O's lament it. Then the second question they were asking everybody was, if you believe that professionalism is a relevant concept, what threats and challenges do you think it faces today? And Osler said in 1897, physicians as a rule have less appreciation of the value of organizations than members of other professions. And I think that has been one of the key developments in medicine in the second part of the 20th century and is so today that doctors no longer work in one-to-one -one units with patients alone. They work within organizations, organizations that place expectations on them, organizations that hold them to account in different ways, and organizations which have their own culture, which determines very much the limits and freedoms and opportunities that their practice presents. So wise words then from uh, the 1890s. What can be done to strengthen those aspects of professionalism that you care about? And Osler said a little bit later in his life, in 1932, the hardest conviction is to set into the mind of a beginner is that education upon which he's engaged is not a college course, but a life course. Not a medical course, but a life course for which the work of a few years under teachers is but a preparation. Now, obviously, the straightforward point about that is that he's emphasizing the point about uh, continuing professional development. But I think it's more than that. It's saying that um, there is more to be done at a fundamental level about changing yourself and, and the way that you uh, behave as a professional over time. And then the final question, I didn't use a quote from Osler, but I actually used a quote from the uh, clinical students, medical students handbook that was around when I was a medical student. So are there aspects of professionalism that are currently defended and that ought to be abandoned? And what Hutchinson said, 14th edition in 1963, one patient is a good witness and another poor. Some seem quite unable to give any precise account of what they feel to be wrong. This may be due to stupidity or the effects of the disease on their mental faculties. It's important to recognize the reason for evasiveness of such patients and not allow oneself to become annoyed with them. Now, when I read that, I was staggered to remember that this was the um, idea of patient-centered care that I was being taught. And um, it quite horrified me, in fact. But the message there, I think, is, is again a very profound one, that the building blocks of what it means to be a doctor, a professional, and what it means to be a physician are built early. And yes, as Osler said, we need to, but if the foundations are faulty, you can build as much as you like, but eventually, the building will start to crumble. And so, and, and I could add to that that the, what, one of the frustrations for me in my old job was how difficult it is to put a feedback loop into the educational system. So if something fairly, fairly profound and systemic was happening in the health service and I was 
aware of it and I documented it and analyzed it. And it required a solution or part of a solution that meant going back into medical school and changing things or even back into postgraduate training and changing something. That feedback loop was virtually non-existent. And often what you were trying to do was resisted by those who really didn't see what right you had to, to demand changes to an educational system. So that was, to leave that now, um, that's a f some reflections on the state of historical and recent thinking on professionalism and I hope emphasizing that it is a very rich concept but it needs clearer um, definition and um, statement. So if professionalism is to do anything, then it's got to solve some of the problems that we encounter every day. And we've got to understand what it means to be a professional sitting in the middle of some of these problems. And I've just picked out three at random, um, more or less at random. The first one uh, relates to a gentleman uh, who was treated in a hospital in the UK recently. And he was a very talented man, a father, a grandfather. Morris Murphy was his name. And he was a musician in the film industry. And he'd played uh, instruments in two very celebrated soundtracks, the Harry Potter films and the Star Wars films. Well loved, much loved in, in his profession. And he went into hospital in London he was uh, fitted with a nasogastric tube, and unfortunately, the tube was placed in his lungs rather than into his stomach, and he was killed by the hospital. Um, now, in the UK, the, we've, we, this is one of the patient safety problems we've majored on, and although the number of deaths and severe harm caused by misplacement of nasogastric tubes in, is small each year in proportion to the number of uh, procedures done. Um, nevertheless, people shouldn't be dying as a result of this procedure. And this is only, and I'm not talking about one of my favorite subjects, patient safety today, but this is, this is only one of many, 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 many problems where we kill patients inadvertently by um, a whole mixture of things, but basically uh, in ways that pose risks that should not be there in our healthcare system. And um, some of this is to do with uh, inexperience of uh, of, of junior doctors. Some of it is to do with the fact that we, d we don't standardize enough high-risk procedures because it's an anathema to clinical autonomy to standardize procedures. We don't always supervise properly and we sometimes we don't train specifically in procedures like this. So as a result, patients are dying who shouldn't be dying. So if we have a new vision of professionalism, will it make things like this better? What, what will it do to save a man like uh, Morris Murphy from being inadvertently killed in, in, a, in an everyday clinical situation? Will professionalism help with that? Well, if it is to, then it has to challenge these ideas about um, more specific training for specific procedures, it has to challenge the idea that it is uh, bad to standardize practice. We should, allow, um, uh, we should allow people to have their freedom of decision making. Of course we should allow that, but also we should uh, standardize on some occasions. And here's an example of uh, standardization, the World Health Organization surgical checklist, which I was involved in helping to uh, develop and launch, and now widely used around the world and in this country as well. But as I've traveled around the UK um, over the last couple of years, I've asked people how it's going, people that I meet, uh, and 
they'll usually say it's going very well, but some of them say, um, we are using the checklist, but the surgeons are very reluctant to participate. And I've heard several anecdotes in, in the last few months of surgeons who prefer to scrub up on their own because they regard participation in the checklist activity as childish and beneath them. And as we all know, the early impact of the checklist has been achieved because of a team working together, doing something which seems a routine, something that a, an airline pilot and a co-pilot would do every time they took off, even though they may have done it a thousand times before. Because just once in a while, they will spot something that would have gone wrong if they hadn't been actively checking it. So I would say to you, as I would say to my colleagues in surgery in the UK, what will you do about that? Are you prepared to regard members of your surgical community who took that attitude just to regard them as uh, free to express their own free will? Or are you going to say, that is bad professional practice and we won't tolerate it? So that's a, perhaps a bit more provocative than you would like to hear this morning, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a good example of where professionalism has to bite it has to make a change in some of these areas which are posing risks to our patients. And then the final example is this very um, uh, depressing and um, unacceptable situation that we had in one of our hospitals in uh, Staffordshire. It was a foundation trust. It was um, the standards of care were poor and elderly patients were neglected. Mortality rates were high, and um, the emphasis, and this was the regulator's report, was the hospital's board had basically majored on money and activity, and as a result of that, standards of care had declined. Now, this is a, a more complex example of what we might expect from professionalism, but you in this country and in, in Canada and New Zealand and many other parts of the world, there have been many inquiries which, although different in context, have some of the same features where there is a, a meltdown in the culture of the organization. And so that standards of care fall, everybody knows they're poor, but they don't, they don't see the... Um, importance and seriousness of it the way the outside world would do. They become insular. And so the challenge, I think, of professionalism here would be um, what sort of professionalism can you create that is resilient to adverse cultures? Because you will sometimes get <clears throat> these adverse cultures where the, the forces are malign and they're against the patient. Will professionalism rise within an organization and sweep out that sort of situation, almost nip it in the bud before it happens? Because it needs to happen. These things aren't common, but we've all had them and we don't want to see any more of them. So if I were to pick out the features of professionalism that I think are, are important, I'd pick out here... Three, the ability to remain patient-centered at all times, back to Osler. The ability to be knowledgeable and skilled, and then an urge to constantly improve. And all of those are, I think, a challenge to us because in a high technology world, it's sometimes easy for the compassion to be squeezed out and it needs to be actively built in on every occasion. And with so much to do, it sometimes seems like a luxury to stand back and try and work out whether there's something in your practice that can be improved and 
but, it, but it's essential that the person who is delivering the care probably has the best insight in how to make it get better, but she or he just doesn't have the space and the time and sometimes the, um, the tools and techniques to be able to do that. So the professional surgeon, professionalism in surgery, I think embodies those three main um, strands. So day to day, when somebody gets up and goes to work and wants to adhere to a strong ethos of professionalism, we want them also to reflect on where they are in the day and what they're doing and whether they feel that they are fulfilling what they set out to do and what their profession expects of them. So the need for reflection is important and here's just a few illustrations of the sorts of things you would expect from a reflective surgeon. She might ask herself, was I really compassionate? Did I listen and, and explain as the patient walks out the door? Those are the sorts of reflective um, thoughts that the surgeon might have. He might ask himself, was this my decision or did I share the decision with the patient? Was I aware of the most up-to-date evidence when I was making my clinical decisions? Very challenging, actually, if you were to reflect on those things. And then... Is my technique as good as others? What are the data telling us? When I, talk about, I talked about my experience of looking at excellent teams over the years in the um, UK, um, I seldom saw clinical excellence without an avid use of data, uh, a great liking for comparison, for uh, documenting your service, analyzing it, looking at gaps between what the best are doing and what you're doing. So a great love of data, which again, I think is, uh, is, is strong in, in many systems, but isn't universal. And this, this basis of comparison, I think, is very, very important. And it builds on the competitive side of, of surgeons. So if we were to look at, again, based on what I've said at some of the challenges of professionalism, most healthcare systems are in um, varying degrees of change and reform, and most doctors and nurses and other health professions see that very negatively, and um, understandably so in, 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 in some cases, but there is a need to adapt to a changing world, and to, but to retain the concept of professionalism and allow it to be shaped and adapted by that change. I do think a new educational model is needed, uh, one that is more responsive to findings within the day-to-day -day world of, of healthcare and the ability to, to take account of those, particularly in fields like, um, like safety. I think there is a mismatch between um, what people practice in quality improvement and quality assurance and, and patient safety. There's a mismatch between that and what people are taught and trained. Uh, but I, I would commend the work that um, uh, Bruce and Marilyn and others have done uh, in producing the, first, the world's first patient safety curriculum uh, under the uh, WHO prog program which I lead. It's a brilliant piece of work and it's widely admired internationally. And then even before the credit crunch um, that's affected most parts of the world, there was a debate about sustainability of healthcare, aging populations, advances in technology, rising expectation, the usual suspects, all of which were driving need and demand for healthcare higher. And then on top of that, we have a financial crisis. So creating, for practicing professionally in that environment of resource constraint and even resource reduction is going to be uh, a huge challenge. But I, I come back to this 
ability to remain patient-centred uh, patient despite all change. Now, when um, I started off life myself as a surgeon, and um, until I passed my FRCS, I got interested in the wider um, aspects of medical care. Of course, since I left surgery, I will always be a failed surgeon, so I do have some regrets about that. But um, I loved my time in surgery and the um, quality of the thinking and decision making, and particularly the decisiveness with which surgeons uh, exercise their, uh, their judgment. But I did have some bad times as well. And I think those um, hopefully are a thing of the past, but I find sometimes taking echoes from the past and testing them against the present very valuable. And when we think back in our careers, all of us, I know, think about individual patients that we've encountered. And I remember one night um, I hadn't been um, in surgical training very long, and the city in which I was training, there were, there were no SHOs, so it was just, uh, and there were no senior registrars at the time, there was just three layers, the consultant, the registrar, which was me, and then the house officer. And um, in my first two weeks in uh, a trauma and orthopedic service, a patient was admitted with a serious head injury. And um, I assessed him, and he seemed to be in a pretty bad state. So I rang the consultant to ask him to come in. And the response of the consultant to me was, having described the symptoms to me, he said, well, he's going to die. Um, have you ever done burr holes before? And I said, no. And he said, well, it will be good experience for you. He's going to die anyway. Um, and left me with the immortal phrase, carry on, old lad. So I found that situation even then distressing with the benefit of a wider perspective now, it, it seems even worse. But um, what I did was uh, I rang around the hospital and found that one of the medical registrars who was in bed had once done uh, three months of neurosurgery as part of his neurology training. And I got him out of bed and he knew how to do burr holes. I assisted him. And that patient walked out of hospital alive with relatively little uh, residual disability. And that was in the days when the um, model of professional training in some parts of the Western world was based on throwing people in at the deep end. And it wasn't good. It was not good for the trainee, and it was not good for the patient. And maybe over time you got some highly skilled, highly competent surgeons at the end of it because they'd had to deal with so many um, situations learning in that way. But it wasn't a good form of training. I can't believe that such things would still exist today. But I think it, again, is a, an emphasis on if your first priority is the patient, then everything else flows from that and you do everything that you have to do uh, for that reason. So keeping that flame of compassion burning um, at all times is, I think, the thought that I would like to leave you with. So thank you for listening this morning.